Okay. Hey, folks. Sorry, uh, it's so late. Uh, the question was uh, whether I was going to cancel or just do late, and I figured I would do it late because people may watch the replay, and I already have a night of work scheduled and all that kind of stuff. So we'll just jump into what I wanted to start with as an initial topic, which is historical accuracy in fiction. That includes movies, comics, books, anything where you're creating fiction, that is, you're not actually recording history. Historical accuracy is something okay. that people either um, worry a lot about or they don't worry about at all. And um, I think the truth of the matter is, as a, as a creator, it's better to err on the side of being too accurate than not accurate enough. Um, historical accuracy as a thing is really something that's a little bit new as far as an issue. And there's a couple reasons for that. The first one is when you're living in an era, you don't think about the accuracy of that era. And history is written usually after the fact. His historians catalog information from the past and assemble it in a cohesive narrative that allows people to understand uh, all of the many complex events of the past. So, for instance, if you're reading Cassius Dio, who's a, a very famous um, his, uh, historian of Rome of Greek origin, um, he's writing more than 100 years after most of the emperors that he's that he's cataloging in his histories. So you have to wonder, is that historically accurate? Well, it could be and it could not be, partly because he's living in a little bit different era, and so his interpretation of events is colored by the, the time period that, that Cassius Dio is living in, but also because you have a time filtering of important details. When you're living in the era, you don't think about recording, you know, how you went to the bathroom, like how you how you manage bodily functions. And we know to a certain extent how Romans managed bodily functions essentially through archaeology, but there weren't a whole lot of people sitting there cataloging exactly how um, how you might use a toilet. And there were public toilets. And so some of the some of the records are like ar you know archaeological records. Here's a public toilet. It had water running underneath it. People would go and do their business in the toilet and the water would carry it away. Um, but you know, a lot of it is not is not uh, it's not possible to be completely accurate. Enter the twentieth century, where you have a whole bunch of movies, and so the first time with movies, you have a real focus on um, being able to visually represent some era of the past. And early movie makers didn't care too much about being accurate; they wanted to get the flavor of what people expected from a particular period, including the medieval period. Um, of which I tend to talk a lot about because I think it's the most misunderstood period as far as what actually people lived like and, and things like that. Um, but they have a, a flavor that they want to communicate and they just put the things in the movie that communicate that flavor and don't worry about like the costumes being an anachronistic. So like they'll have medieval armor uh, that's, you know, very displaced for time because armor evolved a lot during um, from the fall of the Western Roman Empire until... Um, you know, Columbus. Armor evolved quite a bit during that period. So uh, it's not uncommon when you're watching a movie to see, you know, one guy's got like maybe a plate cuirass on and, and another guy's got like just a male shirt and a coif and another guy's wearing like a a, um, a sugar loaf helm, uh, but it's supposed to be King Arthur, right? So there's always like a lot of displaced details in Hollywood movies. And it's only until recently that um, there's even been, anyone's even bothered to want to do things historically accurate. Um, even as recent as uh, Braveheart, which I believe is 1995, uh, Braveheart is horribly historically inaccurate. It's historically inaccurate in a way that's almost comical. Now, it's a good movie. Uh, I like it as a movie. It's a very well-told story, if you look at it as just a story. But in terms of what's presented there, it's very there's a lot of anachronism. For one thing, they're all wearing their kilts and they're wearing uh, what's called belted plaid. And belted plaid um, is is a thing where you have a big, basically it's like a big um, plaid blanket. And you wrap it around your waist and then you you throw it over your shoulder and you belt it onto yourself. Um, and so uh, a lot of Scotsmen wore this. Not in the uh, 12th and 13th century, which is where Braveheart takes place. I think Braveheart actually takes place in the 13th century. So they didn't wear belted plaid in the 13th century. They wore it in like the 16th century. Um, so what did they wear back in the in the 13th century? Well, they wore 
pants. <laughs> you know, kilts. You know, the the free the free legs is not uh, as traditional a Scottish attire as people think it is. So belted plaid didn't come until way later, but they put it in the movie because they wanted to communicate that these were Scotsmen and they were Highland Scotsmen, and so they made them look like dirty Highlanders. Um, when William Wallace, in particular, was a knight, uh, which means that he went in, he didn't go into battle wearing uh, belted plaid. He went into battle wearing uh, full armor to protect himself, uh, and he was also f- quite wealthy, wealthy enough to have the armor and a horse um, and, and those sorts of things. You know, they have him using this uh, this claymore sword, this um, this big Zweihander, this big two-hander. And Zweihanders and those large claymores, again, they weren't a thing until the Renaissance. Um, so you have all of these elements in Braveheart that are inaccurate, and the story itself is inaccurate as well. So like I said, if you imagine it's a fantasy story, it, I think it's quite a good movie, and it's very well done. Mel Gibson knows how to make a movie and make it have a lot of impact, and there's lots of elements there. And and even the music, right? The music's meant to hearken to, to the Highlands, but like the bagpipe is actually a modern instrument. It's not an ancient instrument at all. At all. So there's a scene where there's like a guy playing a bagpipe, and Highland pipes were not bagpipes. Bagpipes, I think really became a thing in the 19th century same idea as tartan right so there's this idea that you wear a tartan like you you know your name like i'm a Stuart, so there's Stuart plaid which is also the plaid i believe of the english crown um so there's a plaid that's associated with your clan but historically that was just a pattern that developed where that clan lived so the Stuart plaid was where you know the lowland Stuarts were and so they developed this particular pattern of colors. And if you had a McCandless plaid, it was from a different place. But people wore whatever plaids they wanted to. It didn't really matter to anyone. Um, so that's a great example of something that's horribly historically inaccurate, but it still won Best Picture. Not only did it win Best Picture, but it was nominated for Best Costumes. And the costumes were all out of whack. A lot of them looked good. Like they're, you know, they're wearing mail, but they're... If they're wearing it incorrectly, it's often um, you see what's called knitted mail, which is where you have a shirt, you get like a sweater, and you get silver spray paint and you just spray paint the, the knitted sweater. And so it looks kind of like mail until you get real close and you're like, that's a spray painted sweater. Um, and that's because mail is expensive and difficult to make. And so in a lot of cases, you also have butted mail, which is where they just take two links and they just kind of like make a ring out of them. Historically, you had riveted mail, which is way longer to make and much more expensive and actually works. Butted mail is not much protection because you can just punch right through it. Um, So that's my intro. That's a great example of one that's historically inaccurate. There's a recent one called, uh, I think it's called Outlaw King. It's actually quite historically accurate, including a lot of the practices. So you have a really interesting thing where in the last 20, 30 years, it's become a thing to be more historically accurate and to to represent um, re- represent historical accuracy to a greater degree. So with that introduction, let me see if there's some questions uh, sort of surrounding this topic, and then I'll get into talk about how you can approach this as an author in a way that's not going to make you spend months or years researching some historical elements, and also how this applies to fantasy, science fiction authors, and comic book artists, those types of folks um, that are looking to have um, things that make sense be presented in their work. Um, So let me see if there's any questions here. And and guys, I have written historical fiction. I don't have any of my books sitting around, um, but uh, Muramasa Blood Drinker you can read, which takes place in Sengoku or, or late Muromachi period Japan. People tend to like the uh, historical accuracy of that book, but I'll tell you how I managed to write it um, without, you know, without having to spend years as a Muromachi scholar to understand the period. I'm just doing your standard kind of armchair history reading. Um, okay, let's see here. I have a sort of question or observation about the jungle by Sinclair. Ooh, the jungle. It's not a well-written book, I don't think. Uh, funnily enough, it's remembered as a muckraking piece on the meat industry, when in fact it was a critique of the horrific treatment of newly arrived migrant workers. It made me think of the dangers of misinterpretation of historical fiction. Absolutely. It was also, you know, it was very, um, you know, people think it was about the meat industry and it was about people. And it was kind of like a Fabian socialist. It was a leftist piece of, of propaganda. Um, not that you can't put out leftist pieces of propaganda, but once that's abstracted from its time period, um, then you you don't have that context by which you're you're able to see what 
it's actually about. Uh, likewise, the Wizard of Oz was originally like a political allegory, I believe. And the Wizard of Oz was like Teddy Roosevelt and um, all these things had symbolic meaning at the beginning of the 20th century and have since lost that symbolic meaning because we're no longer living in that period. Um, this is something that can be interesting when you look at period pieces as well. So if you go back and you read Jane Austen, I'm not really a fan of Jane Austen because it just doesn't interest me, but uh, the things that are not in a historical manuscript are interesting because you don't put in the things that people already know and understand. You don't stop and explain, you know, uh, so there's a, not a lot of explanation in Jane Austen for the social arrangements of upper middle class British women uh, in the 19th century. And that's just because that's who it was targeted for. So if you were to write a book that was targeted towards, you know, uh, veterans of the United States Army, you wouldn't spend a lot of time explaining the hierarchical structure of the army or what each rank is and what, you know, what an O3 is. You wouldn't, you wouldn't bother explaining that because you're preaching to the choir. So it's kind of the same thing there, uh, which makes accessing some of those, uh, some of those pieces rather interesting uh, or rather difficult in some cases. Um, so yeah, S Upton Sinclair, I mean, that's a, it's a good, it's a good example. I don't like the book, but uh, it's one of those that people think is important. And so they read it and then they miss what was actually important about it. Um, see here, historicism. Anyone can do it, basically reinterpret it through an ideological lens. Um, how cultural Marxist lament took technological progression made us uncivil and romanticize the tribal man. The noble savage, um, all were equal because of someone or something. You can actually find a whole lot about the noble savage myth. Um, there's two books, rather modern um, political philosophy books that I've read that cover this. One is called Plagues of the Mind by um, one of my teachers, actually, um, um, uh, Bruce Thornton. And the other one is called uh, A Conflict of Visions, and it's by Thomas Sowell. And you go back to the 19th century, you have the Romantic movement happening in the 19th century. And the Romantic movement was essentially a bourgeois European movement, which is why you don't really have romanticism in the United States. You don't need to romanticize nature when you live in it, right? And so what's interesting is you have books like Walden that are considered romantic pieces and were very popular. Um, but most, you know, most people in the United States kind of lived on the frontier. The majority of people didn't live in cities. They lived out in a rural, more, um, more agrarian society. So the ideas of romanticism didn't appeal to them. It was the urbanized, it was the urbanized bourgeois in, um, in Europe that seemed to be very obsessed with the romantic ideals. And one of the things they looked at was the American Indian. So they thought that they could look across the ocean at these uh, Native Americans and they saw the noble savage. So a lot of our myths about American Indian, Indians, a lot of the attitudes that you see from American Indians are just reflections of the white man's view of them uh, from the 19th century, particularly that they were somehow noble savages, that because they weren't, you know, they didn't have this modern industrial life that hindered them and, uh, and controlled them and uh, gave them lots of... of um, Lots of iron products and, and things like that, that they were somehow closer to nature and therefore more noble. If you know enough about Native Americans, you realize that they're just people, right? They're not, they're not special people. They're, they're people, they have their own cultural, you know, they have their own cultural traditions, their own, um, their own way of organizing themselves, but they certainly weren't more noble than uh, the whites who in many cases displaced them. There's plenty of historical record of very, very grievous acts by um, various Native Americans. Um, so, you know, they're not they're not that noble and they didn't necessarily act noble towards each other. One of the things uh, that's interesting when you look at the historical records of American Indians is the, the tribal, like once they get into larger tribal structures, um, a lot of them are not nearly as free as you would like to think that they were. Uh, the smaller tribes were more, you know, uh, anarchistic and, but they certainly weren't noble and they certainly weren't, uh, uh, didn't lack for, um, they, they didn't have like a modern sensibility where they, they like wept over killing a deer or something like that. Um, they, they were just people that were trying to live their lives and, and, uh, had all the flaws of every other kind of people that existed. Um, so a lot of that is, is our reflection on that. Um, 
favorite historical Roman picture, Scipio and Caesar. You can buy a Scipio shirt on my on my store. So my store has a Scipio Africanus shirt, if you're meaning that Scipio. There's also Scipio Aemilianus, who actually destroyed Carthage, famously uh, left no stone standing upon another and then plowed salt into the earth so nothing would ever grow there. Now, actually, let's talk about the conquest of Carthage from a historical perspective. Um, a lot of times we wouldn't understand why Rome did the things it did. Like, why did it uh, preemptively go to war with Carthage in the Third Punic War, having already defeated them and sort of brought them to heel uh, in the Second Punic War by uh, Scipio Africanus finally defeating Hannibal, who went on to go fight in Greece and for other people, by the way. Um, why did they do that? Well, uh, I think it was Cicero would famously end every speech with, Carthage must be destroyed. And the reason was they knew that as long as that Carthage existed, and its people existed, and its culture existed, that eventually it would rise up and threaten Rome again. It was one of the only uh, empires to ever really threaten Rome. Um, when Hannibal marched into Italy, it was a very, very big deal when he crossed the Rhone River and, and came into northern Italy. So um, by utterly wiping out Carthage and removing its memory from all of the people that were there and all of the tribes which surrounded it. And, and one of the ways that um, Scipio Africanus won the Second Punic War is he convinced some of the rival kingdoms to actually join his cause and overthrow Carthage. Um, and some of those things, by the way, inspired Machiavelli. If you never read The Prince by Machiavelli, that's, that's, that should be required reading just in general. Uh, so people didn't understand that, but Rome, Rome understood that preemptive war for them was better than a war prolonged, that you only you, war was not a thing to be avoided. You only put it off to advantage or disadvantage, um, depending on which one you wanted. And so uh, obviously Cicero or Cicero thought that it shouldn't be put off. And so eventually, you know, Carthage was destroyed, Scipio Aemilianus, um, who like his ancestor, I think it was actually his wife's ancestor, um, uh, didn't fall into political favor after actually achieving victory. Scipio Africanus uh, could not manage the politics of Rome when he came back victorious from uh, from Carthage. Um, alternative history is very interesting as well. Let's see if there's some more questions or comments. Um, my question: Can implementing inaccuracies or can be implementing accuracies be useful in making rules in the story's reality, testing its fluidity and malleability? Absolutely. Um, so to me. Like, I, I, if I come from a talk about fantasy, for instance, fantasy usually you think of weapons that are, you know, that are like this, right? That are completely implausible, like a completely implausible axe with a giant, wicked bat head, right? Um, we'd start thinking of fantasy weapons like that because people think about what looks cool rather than what would work. But if you want to make a world that, that feels real, you want things which have real function. That's my approach to it. So swords should be like swords. Uh, swords shouldn't be, you know, jagged, have teeth everywhere like they're like you see in like World of Warcraft or something like that. So I'm a fan of of things being functional. And if you start from everything that you put in the story is going to have a function, and if you create something new, it needs to have some sort of specific function within your story. Um, then that then that works. And if you want to be historically accurate, and you're setting something in a historical period then what exists at that time, those are your limitations. If you're writing something in 19th century, the United States, um, you can do telegraphs, obviously in the second half of the 19th century, but you, you're not really gonna have telephone calls. Um, so you can think of, well, you know, there, there'd be a way for them to send a message uh, quickly cross country, but there wouldn't be a way for them to, to, um, to just talk on the phone. It, it's, it'd be faster than writing letters, but it's not, it's not as fast as talking on the phone. And so you think of those limitations, or how long does it take to, to travel from one place to another? That's a really good one for, for figuring out how your story needs to actually be sensible. Um, so if you're writing a Western, knowing how far a horse can really travel in a day is probably a pretty good idea. Um, a horse on flat land can travel you know, 50, 60 miles in a day if you're really pushing that horse. But out in like the Western wilderness, you're not going to be getting you know more than you know, 30 miles, 40 miles a day with a horse because the horse is going to spend most of its time walking. And horses do walk faster than people and they do have better 
you know, they're more robust than people when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, but they're not, you know, they need rest, they need water, they need all those sorts of things. So you're not extending, you're not extending your range with the horse that much further than you would if a person were walking. The advantage of the horse is it lets you carry pack and gear and all kinds of other things and you don't have to stop as much and it does go quicker and you're not as tired at the end. Saddle soreness, you should know about saddle soreness. Uh, if you don't know what saddle soreness is, it's people who are not used to riding in the saddle, you actually have to use your muscles to sit up and control the horse. Um, so knowing how those things, knowing how to like ride a horse would be a good thing. And knowing how people, knowing what the saddle looked like historically. If you watch the movie Gladiator, you'll see that... Um, you know, you see, you see all these Roman cavalry officers riding around, and you see that they have stirrups. Stirrups were not a thing during um, during that particular time period, which is when I think it was uh, uh, Marcus Aurelius was was emperor. Um, stirrups didn't didn't become a thing until the Middle Ages. So if, if you have stirrups, I think the stirrups were there so they could actually ride the horses on camera, um, not to be historically accurate. And I. I I think sometimes you can make those decisions where it's like, we need to shoot this with people who know how to ride horses. We don't want to have to learn how to ride horses like Roman cavalry officers with no stirrups. That might be a bit extreme, especially when you want the horses to be doing lots of things and there's, you know, spears flying around and maybe you have things blowing up by the horses. Uh, even well-trained animals, that's not going to work unless they're, they have the attack on them that they're used to operating with. So sometimes you make those sorts of sacrifices. Um, I read the novel for The Man in High Castle, which decreased my interest for the show personally. I think it's an okay show, but it only shares the premise with the novel. I haven't, I haven't seen either one. Um, let me see if there's some more questions. I'm pretty far back in the questions, so let me, let me go through them as quick as I can. Um, I think the only time it's okay to be historically wrong is if you're retelling a certain story to children like Pocahontas or Hercules. I think, yeah. Um, so in certain cases, it's totally okay to be historically wrong. And that's if it's mythological. If you're if you're telling a story that is primarily myth, you don't need to worry too much about anachronism. So Hercules, he might have been his, a historical figure somewhere around the Trojan War, but we don't know how the Greeks lived around the Trojan War because that was before the Bronze Age, Bronze Age collapse. If you don't know what the Bronze Age collapse was, it was the collapse of the original socialist societies. They had what are called these palace economies where the palace would manage all of the resources. They take in everything and they distribute everything out. You could think of it as an early version of centralized socialism. And there was a big economics collapse and then a dark age where the Greeks like forgot their writing system and all the Mediterranean peoples had to relearn their writing from the Phoenicians and the Hebrews, which um, were in the Levant at that, at that point in time. Um, and uh, so it's a very interesting thing if you if you look into the Bronze Age collapse, but but we don't know what they looked like, right? So there's no way to historically have Hercules um, or Heracles is, is his Greek name. You can't historically have him because you don't have enough information about what historically it looked like. And if you tried really hard to be historically accurate, you'd have guys with bronze axes, and it would look very weird um, compared to what people are used to. So you tend to just go with like, what's the Greek aesthetic? What's the Hellenistic aesthetic? And you, you go with what was popular um, in the period leading up to Alexander the Great. So the, the um, what's called the classical period, before, which comes really before the Hellenistic period, but Hellenism is, is usually mixed in there as well. And so you have, you know, the, the bronze shields and the spears and the helms with like the, the very prominent nose guard, the stuff that's pulled off the, the Greek pottery. So you have that there. And that gets the audience, it gives them the flavor of the history that you're going for. But if you're like, if you're doing the Iliad or the Trojan War, there's no way to be historically accurate because you don't, we don't know anything about the historical event or even if it happened. Um, so you just throw that out the window and try to make it cool and try to make everything make sense. So you probably shouldn't have ancient Greek armies, you know, using trebuchets, for example, or or advanced catapults or things like that. Um, there were approaches to sieges um, in the ancient world uh, that didn't involve catapults or trebuchets. That's mostly a medieval thing and, and um, late classical period, depending on how you want to draw the line. Um, but you didn't get trebuchets like until the 13th 
century, I think, um, which was a, a really good catapult where you could fling a rock really far. What they used to do is they dig under the walls, do what's called sap the walls. So you dig tunnels under the walls and try to collapse the wall. Um, and that might be like people think there's a symbolism with Jericho, like the you know the Hebrews marched around the city of Jericho ten times and then the walls fell down. Some people think, oh, well, that's symbolic for them digging around the walls until they fell down and then they conquered Jericho, um, rather than having it be something divine. But that's you know that was the way that you you engaged in sieges back then. So it would make sense that it spent they spent ten years trying to breach the walls of Troy because they couldn't sap underneath them, and so they invented the, the Trojan horse to get through it. Um, so you would avoid things like that that are very obviously anachronistic. Um, let's see here. Why was Rome just so indomitable and awesome for multiple generations? <laughs> Has to be one of my favorite questions. That is, uh, I don't have enough time to answer it. Comes down to a few things. Um, first of all, a focus on... So they had a Hellenistic type of philosophy. They had classical, they were influenced by Greeks a lot. But the Romans always looked first at what worked. So number one is they looked at what worked and they did what worked. Number two is optionality. So one of the things with Roman generals when you study them is that they were big on optionality. Um, it wasn't so much about having a particular strategy that would always beat the enemy. It was knowing how to set up the, the field and set up uh, the battle so that you had the better set of the options. You had big upsides with low downsides. Um, just as an example, you have, um, I'm trying to remember which city he was sieging. I want to say it was Athens, um, but it was Sulla. So if it wasn't Athens correctly, it might have been like Corinth, but um, I believe it was the siege of Athens. Um, Sulla uh, Roman, very famous Roman general, first dictator for life, um, who actually gave up his power, by the way. Um, he dedicated a few men to sapping one part of the wall to bring it down. Now, this was a risk because those men could all be killed. They could be wiped out by the Greeks in the attack. But it's a great optionality because you could lose 40, 50, 100 men sapping this wall. That doesn't have a big impact on your legions of multiple thousands. It's a small impact. So it does reduce your fighting force a little bit, but not by a lot. But the upside is tremendous because when you bring down those walls, now all your legions can come right into Athens and sack the place. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, the optionality there is great. Sola was, as far as Sola being a great general, his, his um, great tactical mastery was happening outside of battle. It was knowing how to exercise his options leading up to battle so that he could attain victory. During the Civil War, when he came back to Italy, um, he would, there were several several times where consuls were set out to fight Sola um, on the behalf of Marius, and uh, who was who had kind of taken over the, the Roman hegemony at the time, the political hegemony uh, or oligarchy at the time. And he would set up his armies and then he would send, send his men into the other camp to go fraternize with them, and then they would just abandon their general and come join his army. So there were several ba battles where the the um, the Roman generals that were opposed to him couldn't even fight the battle because their armies just deserted them and went to Sulla's side. And then when they wouldn't do it, he said, I have given everybody enough chances to join my side. He was absolutely merciless with um, the people that didn't join his side. He like would he left no man alive and that sent a message to anyone else which was like you need to be on my side or the consequences will be very severe and also sent a message to everybody who joined his side oppose me and the consequences will be severe but also you made the right choice look that could have been you being dead um, so Sulla was a big master of that and that goes for most of the Roman generals um, all the way up to um, the fall of Byzantium um, and so a lot of people think Rome fell in, I think, 476 AD. That was the city of Rome uh, became the kingdom of Italy. It didn't really fall. Um, there was no real fall of Rome, but but there was actually the fall of Constantinople that happened in the 15th century, and um, that was a big deal. So uh, not, to, not to just talk too much about history. I want to talk about historical accuracy and how you get to that. So let me, let me give you a couple tips for uh, historical accuracy if you're writing historical fiction. What you want to think about is the things which are actually going to have an impact on the story. Those are the things which you want to mention. So armor. So if you're writing something that involves war, you need to know the armor that the and the weapons that the, the people are going to be using. And you need to have a fairly 
a good grasp of them, but you don't need to know every little detail. Um, so if you were setting something in North Italy in the 15th century, you know, there's that's the classic plate armor that you guys, the knight in shining armor. And I use 15th century armor in my book, Needle Ash, um, as sort of a, a highly evolved set of plate armor that's very effective. You can know every part of the armor, or you can mention the parts of the armor that actually will matter in, in battle. So, you know, uh, uh, an arrow bounced off his cuirass, an arrow stuck in his, his cuisses, which is like your pants, right? Um, you know, the sabatons that cover the boot. You need to know kind of the big parts that are going to have an impact and that the horse is covered in, in barding, which is horse armor. But you don't need to know the names of every part of the horse armor, right? Because it's not really going to have an impact. Likewise, you don't need to know... You know, you don't need to know every in and out for the way that like the Milanese army organized its infantry in the 15th century, because it's probably not going to impact your story unless you're being super, super pedantic about the way battles are fought. Um, you just need to know like some general ideas about how the army was organized. And, and if you're not writing things about the army, you don't even need to think about that. You can just say, oh, we saw a knight in armor, right? Like if you're writing about artists in, um, in Venice or something or Pisa. Um, so the artists are sitting around in Pisa and, and a knight walks by. You wouldn't want to spend your effort when you're writing going, okay, a knight walked by and he was wearing this kind of armor and he had a, you know, this and he had elbow plates and he had, he looked at his mail and his mail was tarnished in between, uh, you know, you wouldn't, you don't need to go to that level of detail. Um, to do it because that's not that doesn't matter to the characters and it doesn't matter to the story so you want to focus on the things that matter to the story if you're writing something about a painter in renaissance italy you should know how they painted but you should also know like what they how they got their paints and what they did with it you don't really need to know um you don't really need to know how pigs were slaughtered unless the person is slaughtering pigs so if he's an artist he's not he's just like buying meat from a butcher he doesn't care and it doesn't impact the story. So you don't need to research that stuff. Um, know what kind of story you want to write and just research the things that you need to do and put those in. And likewise, you don't need to overload a reader with spurious detail. Um, the main stuff that matters in a story, any story, whether it's historical fiction or not, is the dialogue and the uh, event sequence. So you don't need to stop and write a paragraph about how a sailor was tying knots. And I'm aware that Herman Melville had basically whole chapters on how to tie knots, how to rake knots on a sailing vessel. If you guys have never read The Unabridged Moby Dick, it's hard to read. Um, but there's some things with 19th century literature where you always wanted to write too much rather than not enough because people could always skip the stuff that they didn't want. And that was like a thing that existed in the 19th century is you wrote a lot of extra crap in your books and if people didn't like it they just skipped that chapter or skipped that part they didn't want to know about how you rigged ropes on a sailing vessel so they skipped it um so i'm aware that melville did that kind of stuff but you probably don't you probably don't need to in the in the 21st century spend time on that um only would you need to really spend any time if it mattered for a plot point so if you had a sailor on a sailing vessel and he had to tie a knot a certain way and the rope or the, you know, the peg broke because the rope wasn't tied onto it properly. And that caused the sail to go slack, which caused a problem. And then the sailor got in trouble, or maybe he shirked it onto someone else that got in trouble for tying the knot wrong. Then knowing how to tie that ship's knot matters. But here's the, one of the things that you can do when you're writing a story is you can do the research while you're writing the story for things that matter. It's like, man, I want to have him tie a knot incorrectly and bad things happen. Let me go look up how to tie knots. I mean, how did how did how did they tie the knots in those sailing vessels in the 19th century? And you can go look it up and figure that out. Um, so that's one thing. That's the main thing that I want to communicate is you don't need to put in a lot of extra detail that you don't need to if you're writing a novel. Now, if you're making a movie, if you're doing something visual like a comic book, then you probably do want to know those details um, as much as you can. However. Don't go overboard. You don't need to spend years figuring out exactly what cups they used in some tavern in the Middle Ages because your story, your comic takes place in the Middle Ages. Draw a cup and people will get it. Only the most pedant pedantic and horrible people will bother to care that like you drew uh, just a cylindrical cup instead of some goblet that somebody in Southern France in the 15th century would have used instead of a standard cup. Um, so you probably don't need to worry about that kind of stuff. And even the most pedantic history people, of which I am one, 
we don't care that much about inaccuracies as long as they're not disruptive in your face and affect the plot. Like the fact that you have William Wallace swinging around a 15th century Zweihander instead of, you know, using a regular arming sword, which he would have used in the 13th century. Or a long sword, a long sword, a bastard sword, as some people call it. Um, what about Tarantino? I like how he puts his own flair on period pieces. I actually don't like that, but I do kind of view it as, like, if you're thinking of um, Inglorious Bastards, I think of that as just kind of like a fantasy piece and not really historical. But I don't like Inglorious Bastards, really. Um, let's see here. Let's see if there's some more questions. Uh, they believed in an ideal as long as that ideal held Rome. As long as that ideal held Rome held. I completely disagree from this statement. Um, so I think it's actually the opposite. I think they held certain ideals, but they were very quick to, to, to bend those ideals if it made Rome survive and led to the betterment of Rome. And you can see that in all the politics in the first and second century AD in Rome, or I'm sorry, BC in Rome. You can see it in AD as well, but in BC. Um, traditionally, you know, there was this thing called most maiorum, which meant the tradition. And uh, rather than having a written constitution, um, you'll find that they historically will talk about a constitution, but the constitution that they're talking about is just traditional. It's just people didn't violate tradition. Um, so tradition was really important. This is not the opposite of what you said, but tradition is really important, but they would abandon it in times of need. So, um, you know, when you had a one-year consulship, what would be the equivalent of the presidency in the United States? A lot of people think that our um, the organization of the political structure in the United States is based on the the English Parliament. That's only partly true. It's just as much, if not more, based on classical Roman Republic stuff, where you had the assemblies, which represented the people, and then you had an upper house called the Senate. So even the names, the Senate and the um, the Senate and the and the House of Representatives. House of Representatives is really like the assemblies, um, the Roman assemblies. Um, but anyway, you know, the, that was one of the first things to go is like you had Scipio Aemilianus had several consulships in a row because it took him several years to bring the Gauls to heal and to crush Carthage and to do these different things. And he was consul several times. Every, it used to be in order to limit people's power, you were consul for one year. You had a specific duty during that one year to the armies of Rome as consul. And then you gave up the consulship. And even if you were out in the field, your consulship ended after that year and the next consul would come in to replace you and take over your armies and you would go back to Rome. Um, but as Rome expanded and as it came into contact with more and more hostile and um, and very good people at, at fighting, very resistant people, they let go a lot of those traditions in order to, um, in order to get what they wanted. So um, when you hear someone like Nassim Taleb say, Romans versus Greeks. Greeks were ideals. They held the ideal above any sort of real world thing. And the Romans didn't. They had an ideal, but they would let go of that if they needed to. So if they needed someone to be consul for three years, they were consul for three years as long as they kicked ass and won the war. If they needed someone to be dictator for life, they made him dictator for life in order to preserve Rome. Um, you could make a case that Sola, by, being, uh, by doing what he did, by seizing all the power and all the titles in Rome, may have actually preserved the Republic, and he did give up his power. C Julius Caesar did not really give up his power, but the attempt to resist that eventually led to the formation of uh, what we would today call the Imperial Order. And even the Empire, you still have the Senate and the Assemblies. The Emperor was mostly, um, mostly the collector of all of these titles that related to the military power. And most Emperors died violent deaths, or died on the battlefield, uh, which was actually fairly common, or were assassinated. Um, so the the idea of the empire being an emperor, like Emperor Palpatine, that control had absolute power, that was not a thing. Probably until, and it even wasn't a thing. Um, I'm trying to remember who it was, and and his name escapes me right now. But you guys will probably think of it. Um, that wasn't the case until the end of the 2nd century AD. Where the emperor really did have all the power. Um, now, you know, uh, he was mainly the, the the head of the military. Which is why our the American Republic is based very heavily on the Roman order. Both consul and emperor. And, and we can actually see our own parallel in history, by the way. Where we've gone from 
limited presidencies to very powerful presidencies, imperial presidencies. Anyway, let's move on. What do you think about the community of the sword, Hema practitioners preaching about inaccurate sword fighter in fiction? Um, so Hema stuff's great. The way that Hema guys approach it, um, and I, I watch Hema channels and I, I like Hema, I, I do a little bit of it, um, is that you start with the historical manuals. So um, when people wanted to spread a certain fighting technique, they'd write a manual and they'd go uh, distribute it. So you go and you can look at these historical manuals on how you would hold your sword and different types of guard. Um, and that's what the that's what the practice is based off of. Um, and then there's a lot of practical stuff. Now, a lot of the practical stuff when you're doing staged fighting has to go out the window. And I've, I have a great book on stage fighting that's from a historical practitioner. This is an old book from like the 60s or 70s, but it's very good. Um, it basically teaches you how to do things that look very historically accurate, but are safe to do on screen or on stage. Because that's the other thing is that you have to make it look exciting. You have to make it look um, like it's real, but it has to be safe for the actors. So most HEMA stuff, it's kind of got to go out the window because you have to keep the actors safe. The other half of it, and a lot of uh, guys who critique the stuff like Matt Easton or, um, you know, or... I don't know Thane Thrand, um, who does he does more armor tests, which which is its own cool thing. Um, maybe Shade Diversity. Uh, these guys will look at it as as acknowledging to a certain extent that you can't you can't just do what was historically accurate, partly because it won't be exciting enough. And this was a criticism I got in my book Needle Ashes. I had a I had a duel, and the duel ended after two exchanges. And they're like, that just, I had a couple people say, it just seemed a little anticlimactic. I'm like, it was accurate though. It's exactly how a duel would have gone. It would have been over very quickly because they would have, the, the two fighters, when they're not heavily armored, the first person to strike and draw blood is the person who wins. You kill the other guy pretty quickly. Um, which leads me to a historically accurate movie that I'd like to, um, I'd like to, to tell you all about. And that is The Duelists. I believe Ridley Scott was the director. It's from the 70s. It has Harvey Keitel in it. A lot of great actors. It's very historically accurate as far as the way the duels are fought, what they would have looked like, um, how they would have resolved, and also the cultural attitudes in France at the time, the, the, the way dueling fit into the social fabric. So if you will go and watch The Duelists, I highly recommend the movie. It's, I don't know if it's one of, it, it is one of my favorite movies. I don't think it made it on my list last time I talked about favorite movies, but I might talk about it on the next list. It's great. It does a, and it's beautifully shot. And one of the things you get in these scenes where they're dueling is there's this huge amount of tension because a lot of the duel is them spent holding a sword and it's mostly small sword. There's actually several cool duels. There's a small sword duel. There's a saber duel, which ends in a way that people find weird because they're not used to seeing it in cinema. They The two fighters become too exhausted and bloodied to continue fighting and the, the duel ends. And it's these two guys fight multiple duels and the duels never, never quite resolve in death. Um, but... You know, uh, I think the duel that starts it off, and you can find it on YouTube. You can just look up first duel um, from duelists. Uh, it's a small sword duel, and the two guys are are kind of rounding each other. They have two exchanges, and then Harvey Keitel stabs the guy um, because that's how quick it is. If you watch Olympic fencing, Olympic fencing is a terrible example of actual sword fencing, but see how fast it is. Those exchanges happen fast. And so when you're dueling someone, being able to parry one stroke could mean the difference between life and death. And so it revolves very quickly. And so when I had that in my book, I really wanted it to be convincingly real. So I went with an exchange that was, in my mind, very accurate for the situation. You had a guy using two basket-hilted swords versus um, you know, what would be the equivalent of a Northern uh, Italian knight, unarmored, but with a long sword. And so what he did is he had a couple quick exchanges where he watched what the, the enemy was doing to figure out his technique. Once he knew the technique, he came up with an unorthodox way of countering one of the swords, and then he parried and instantly killed the guy. And that's how quick it happened. It was, it was a very, very fast duel, but that's what I wanted people to come away with. And because of that speed, not only is it convincing, but we also look at this character, Michael's the name of the character in the book, and we're like, what a badass. 
he really shows his competency in that scene. Um, and I looked at it as a great opportunity for, for, for us to see Michael being really good at what he does, being a very, very experienced and proficient warrior and being very good with his sword and knowing how to uh, exercise his options and win that duel. Um, let's keep going. <laughs> Sorry for my nose. I got a little bit of a cold. Um, one of my favorite pieces is Samurai Champloo. I actually like Samurai Champloo as well. Let me quickly... I, I see there's a super chat. I'll get to that in a second. Um, uh, there's so many chats. I'm way behind. I'm really sorry. Um, so Samurai Champloo, it's very anachronistic, and they say so. And they say, it's anachronistic. We just wanted the style. And they just go with the style. And the style communicates what they want it to communicate. And it's cool. If you want something that's a little bit more, it's not. It's still not historically accurate, but it has an edge to it that's more historical. That's uh, Shurigui or Death Frenzy. Death Frenzy is really cool. Um, and there's an anime of it you can watch, and there's a manga you can read. The anime is a very faithful adaptation of the manga. They are both very, very stylistically on point. Now they they take the historical part and they just kind of ramp it up stylistically. But there's a tension to it. There's this idea that duels are over very quickly. You have a character win a duel by flicking out his sword on the ends of his fingers and getting just enough reach to get past the guy's guard and like cut, cut him and kill him. Um, and so there's a lot of cool little situations like that that, that really, um, really make the tension kind of ramped up there. Um, see people talking about socialism. You can see how far behind I am in the chat. I just really like to answer things thoroughly. Have I read Vox Day's analysis of Fight Club? It's very intriguing and insightful. I don't know if I have or if I read it a long time ago. Here's the gist of it. I think he did a stream on it today, but I didn't get to watch it because I was busy. But um, Fight Club is not about fighting. It's about homosexuality. And Chuck Palahniuk is gay. The author is gay. So when you look at it from that perspective, it's it's very interesting. At the same time, it is it. I think it could be about more than one thing at, at one time. And the fighting clearly is not about fighting. It's about something else. It's about some other missing piece of masculinity and brotherhood. Um, but when you look at the book, and uh, I like the book as well as, uh, I don't think the movie had this as strong as the book, but it's clearly about somebody wrestling with their true self. And so the true self is being a closet homosexual. <laughs> uh, that's Fox Day's interpretation. It's very interesting. Um, but I think it could be about more than one thing at a time. Um, I'm a bit obsessed with military history and even me with my limited knowledge know it's a bunch of nonsense. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. All right. Here's the, the super chat from Phil, Film Girl. Thank you very much uh, for the five pounds. I really appreciate it. Uh, just wanted to say thank you for answering my questions and doing these writing tips. It's very useful. Okay. I'm glad you're getting value. I really appreciate the tip. It means a lot to me. Somebody said that at some point in history, for some cultures, battles only lasted until about 10% of the soldiers were dead before the losers would retreat. How true is this? Could be true, could not be true. Depends on the time and the place. Obviously, if you look at something like Waterloo, which had like 45,000 wounded or dead, that was not the case. Um, but if you look at medieval warfare, and if you look at having a campaign, you have to think about optionality. And so if you have the option of retreating when the battle's going poorly to you, you probably want to take that opportunity because you need to preserve your fighting force and see if you can exercise a better option in the next one. So in medieval and late medieval um, campaigns in particular, you had these series of skirmishes. So rather than having an out and out battle, part of the forces would fight and then retreat and run away from each other. Uh, and you'd have these skirmishes until you ended up in a position where one side could really crush the other and make them surrender. So you may, uh, during different periods of warfare, you would have battles end with one side surrendering with only not very many casualties, usually less than 10%, because you'd be put in a position where you knew you couldn't win, and there's no point in having everybody die. And the other side knows this, so they may accept surrender, and then you disarm them, and you have different sorts of things that you end up doing. Um, this was the case, you know, um, throughout many different periods in history. What's interesting is if you look at things like uh, the like the Knights Templar or the Knights of the Hospital, but the Knights Templar are probably more famous for this. Uh, they had this uh, this ideal that they would die rather than surrender. 
And uh, despite this ideal, many of the heads of the Knights Templar were captured <laughs> and held for ransom, um, which which lets you know that that most of the time that wasn't taken that seriously. Because usually, if you things were going sour for you, you'd start trying to negotiate a surrender. And if you were on the side that had the better end of, end of things, you might want to negotiate that because you didn't want to you didn't want to lose you didn't, you didn't want to lose a big portion of your fighting force just to crush the enemy. Right. If you have the ability to make them leave the castle peacefully, which is what the Knights Templar eventually did, you know, if you can get them to leave their castle peacefully, you do that. Like you get them out there. Like why would you have a prolonged siege and that expense and the expense of manpower? You wouldn't do that. So ten percent casualties was, was was probably high for lots of different battle situations. Um, it just depends on on this on how on how it works. Um, you also had a thing with, with which is what's called the route or the route. Uh, but the route was you have some guys fighting and then one side's like things are going bad for us and they just run away they're routed they run away and then uh, you pursue them now the the route the point of forcing a route was that that force now is in disarray and leaves the battlefield which leaves you in a different control of it you would actually not want to pursue the route and there's uh, different sources that list commanders that were unable to control the discipline of their men during the route and so they would pursue the enemy and hack try to hack them and chase them down and in so doing their forces would end up in disarray and it was just chaos what you wanted to do was to force the route on the enemy and then use your infantry to maybe bolster another another manipul another line of, uh, of fighting men to to continue to push things in your in your favor so if you read my battles in needle ash um, they're pretty accurate considering the rule set that i set up um, which is I had, you know, late medieval um, arms and armament plus a little bit of magic. Magic's rare, but it produces an artillery-like effect, which changes the way tactics uh, end up working out for a lot of them. So um, it's it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, Ten percent might be a huge casualty before you you commit to surrender, and during a siege you might have casualties of zero and then surrender because there's you can't get out of the siege. No one's coming. None of your friends are coming to help you. Um, maybe some culture where warfare was very ritualized. Uh, most of the casualties tend to happen when one side gives up and doesn't retreat well. Yes, totally. Lobster's correct. Um, if you look at feudal Japan, it, there was a lot of individual fighting. So there were the common soldiers would fight. And then the samurai, the commanders would come out and be like, you fight me. And then they would do like individual combat. And um, no one, it was very ritualized, so no one would really interfere with that. Um, and you could see how that would leave the Japanese at a slight disadvantage, like when they tried to invade Korea in the, when was that, 15th century? No, 16th century, um, where the Koreans didn't do that. And so they'd be like, kill that knight, you know, <laughs> kill, the, kill the samurai. And so they would just shoot him with arrows and be like, these dishonorable Koreans aren't fighting us one on one. Um, you know, but they, they, they in the reality was uh, during the Korean invasion, I think they they did alter their tactics a little bit anyway. But when you were fighting another person, another warrior of honor, you would want to fight on equal terms so that you could decide who was the the true victor. Um, but that was only part of the part of uh, Japanese battles. In a sci-fi book, do you need to know exactly how some sort of technology works and explain it, or can you chalk it up to science and your character also not knowing why it works either? Do you know how your monitor displays all the colors that it sees? If the answer is no, then the answer for your story is no as well. you got to know the gist of how things work, and you got to know how the big things work. So if you have a space travel story, you need to know, have an idea how they travel through space. Are they folding space like Dune? Are they warping space like Star Trek? Are they just traveling faster than light like in Star Wars? Or is it like my sci-fi stories and they don't travel faster than light, they have time dilation. So it takes them a couple months to get there, but hundreds of years have transpired in the rest of the galaxy while they're traveling. So know those big things because that's gonna affect your story. But you don't need to have some some super complicated idea. Even warp drive, right? Like so, the idea of warp drive in Star Trek is like you shrink the space in front and like expand the space behind. You create this field of warped space and time around the ship, which lets you travel faster than the speed of light, even though you're not really traveling faster than the speed of light. That's knowing how it works. But of course, they don't know. They don't have technology that does that. 
So you just say that it does that and you don't worry about the specifics, just like how you don't know how your monitor works, but you know how to hook it up to your computer. You know how to change the settings. You know what's a good monitor to buy, but you don't know um, exactly how each pixel is lit up unless you're an electrical engineer. But even then you probably wouldn't, wouldn't want to communicate that in a story because it bored the reader. You just want to stick to the big stuff. Um, I'm afraid people won't like it because it's not historically accurate. Let me see here. I'm planning a face of a pirate story in 17th century. However, I want to add magic weapons. Should I continue it as historical fiction or transform into fantasy? Why not do fantasy? If it, Fantasy changes everything, but fantasy makes it so it could be whatever you want it to be. You know, Half the pirate stories are fantasy anyway. Pirates of the Caribbean is pure fantasy. Um, so just go the fantasy route. You can have it in our world or not. Um, write the story that you want to write. I would say don't bother avoiding fantasy if you're worried about historical inaccuracies. This is another thing I want to communicate, which is you can't win sometimes. So you can be incredibly historically accurate and still not win. Um, because there's people, there's two kinds of people in the world. There's people who who are, are pedants and are forgiving, and then there's people who think they're pedants and are unforgiving. Uh, there's more than two. Uh, but there's, there's people who are, who are going to be pedants and are like, uh, you know, they don't like things because they're, they're not historically accurate. Then there's people who think they know what historically accurate is and want to be pedants. I just say this. So I've had complaints. Like I had somebody complain. I wrote this fairy tale called Garamesh and the Farmer. And the princess in it uh, has a hunting dog and goes hunting. And it's like, a, you know. This is so inaccurate that there's a princess going hunting. It's like, it's a fantasy story with dragons, first of all. But women actually hunted in the Middle Ages. Did you not know that? So some people think they know things and they don't. And so, you know, I would I would have been pretty upset if someone left a negative review with that in mind when they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, that's a little bit annoying. But there's a lot of people like that, that they think historically things were like this. It's like, why did they have, you know... I just liked how this medieval setting had everybody, you know, um, wearing nice clothes and, and not being covered in filth and dirt. It's like, well, they weren't covered in filth and dirt in the Middle Ages. That's Monty Python. That's not reality. And Monty Python was making a caricature of what we think about the Middle Ages. Um, so you do get people like that. So you can't, sometimes you can't win, but it's better to be historically accurate and just be historically accurate um, than it is to be um, historically inaccurate and make people mad. Uh, but in, in all cases, I think it's okay to fudge in the interest of story. Um, just as an example in Muramasa, I wanted a scene where they were basically eating in a restaurant. Now there were restaurants. There weren't that many restaurants. We don't know that much about the restaurants in the Muramachi period because it's a pedantic part of life or, or a, a banal part of life. And so they didn't do a lot of writing about it. Uh, so I created one that I thought was kind of fit in that time period, uh, a, a kitchen where they were buying fish to eat. Um, now, was could it be 100% historically accurate? Probably not, but I needed that for the story, so I didn't worry that much about it. Uh, I just wanted to make it reasonably accurate, and I didn't stop and think like, what was the shape of the of the dish that the cook was cooking the fish in? It's like, no, it just didn't. There's a cook cooking fish, he sells it to them, and then they eat it, and then they see this guy that they need to have a conflict with right now, and then they go have it, right? That's what I wanted to have happen. Um, so sometimes you can't win, uh, but it's better to be historically accurate. But if you're focused on what actually matters to the story, it's not it's not that hard. Yeah, do what works best for your story. Um, Solo also killed a lot of people and set an example for later generations that using force to implement politics will is okay-ish. Yeah, um, Sola Sola is. I can't get too much into him, but he's a super interesting historical figure. Absolutely super interesting. Thinking of the Romans, I'm on a slight digression here. Just as an example of historians talking about history after the fact and, and constructing it. Because remember, we remember stories, not facts. So all the many facts that created the reality that was the Roman Empire, all of those different facts don't end up being recorded. A lot of them get thrown out so that you can contextualize the things that are impactful and mat and what matter. And those things are usually viewed through a historian's lens. So they throw out the things like Cassius Dio, 
We don't have a lot of the sources that Cassius Dio was working off of, but we do know that he probably discarded stuff that wasn't important and focused on the things that were important. And there's certain things about attitudes and the historian's, you know, biased attitude toward historical figures that could come across, particularly in Cassius Dio. One of the things is, is the Emperor Nero. So if you were to go Google the Emperor Nero right now, Nero was the final emperor in the Julio-Claudian dynasty at the end of the first century. I don't remember exactly what date he died. Um, but you'll see two accounts of him marrying men. Now, these are very interesting because Romans did not marry men. Men married women. Uh, no men marrying men. That was not a thing in Rome. But there's... The modern world looks at Nero and is like, well, he married a trans woman or he was the first Roman to get gay married or something like that. And they didn't understand what was actually being communicated by Dio. And when you understand Roman culture, you understand that the patriarchy was a thing. So Roman patriarchy was a thing. So it was considered very unmanly, unmasculine, unRoman, and disgraceful to be the partner in a sexual relationship that is penetrated the receptive partner. That is the feminine role. So you notice the the recordings of Nero, who was a very unpopular empire, emperor, especially after his death, and certainly Dio dislikes him or, or has a, a strong bias against him. Um, you see him marrying a man dressed as the bride. And that's an important element because that is, is telling you that... Um, it's portraying Nero not just as a bad emperor, but as a bad Roman, as somebody who was um, not only shirking off the tradition of 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 the consulate and the empire of of the emperor, shirking off his traditions, but also uh, going against Mos Maiorum very strongly, um, saying, "I not only am I going to marry a man, which is unheard of. There's no." There's no historical basis for Romans doing that because Roman marriages weren't about sexual attraction as much as they were about um, social relationships. It was a social thing to be married, and they married and divorced frequently. Um, Augustus was married, I think, a total of four times. Um, and Nero was married several times. So there's this record that Dio writes about of, uh, of him marrying this woman or marrying this man dressed as the bride. And so that signifies that he's the sexually receptive partner in this relationship. He made them was probably never a marriage, but it was an open relationship, which basically meant that he was snubbing his nose at most myorum. He was uh, turning his back on the, the rigid social structure, which made Roman society function. And he was acting in an unmanly, undignified and disgraceful way. Likewise, I'm trying to remember the name of his last wife. Um, so he supposedly beat his pregnant wife to death, um, who was, whose name was Popeye, um, like Popeye. That was kind of funny, Popeye. Uh, and uh, so he married, he had this uh, castrated slave that looked like her, supposedly. Uh, and so people are like, well, he married, he married a, a trans woman. It's like there was no trans back then, right? Um, they didn't view things in those modern lenses. We're putting modern views about about uh, trans and uh, transgenderism upon something that just it doesn't apply. So he had some some sexual relationship with a, a castrated slave who eventually killed him when he was unable to commit suicide. And then uh, the next emperor had some sort of relationship with him too. Dio writes about this stuff because it's it's not not because it's okay. In other words. So people, modern view, people view it, oh, people accepted this relationship. It's like, no, Dio was writing about these things specifically because they're not acceptable in Roman culture, because they were viewed as bad. That's why he's writing about them. It's because Nero was a bad emperor, and here's all these things he did that were bad. You know, he 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 went against the tradition of marriage and had men marrying men. Now, men could have relationships with men, kind of like off the books, but you couldn't get married to them, and it was considered very not okay to be the receptive partner in that not that men didn't do that but it was not on the surface level like people it wasn't public you know um people might be in the closet of that but it was, wasn't public um so it's him it's him openly flaunting uh, his opposition to the roman patriarchy and most maiorum that's what that's about so it's a great example of how um once we lose context of the way things are written by the historians themselves you don't realize what is actually being written about 
historically. You don't realize that it's not about Roman society being accepting of um, of homosexual marriage. They weren't. Uh, it was about them being unaccepting of it. Uh, it's it's actually the opposite meaning when you when you look at uh, the time and place Dio was writing. Um, and Dio was was still a pagan, even though he was writing well after, um, well during the the rise of Christianity in the Roman Empire. Uh, so that's a great example of of how these things can be misinterpreted. So you wouldn't want to write a, a book in in Rome where like men marry men because you heard that Nero married a man. That would not be socially acceptable. And even if the emperor did it, that doesn't mean other patricians would be okay with it. They wouldn't. <laughs> my, one of my plots revolves around a very specific and somewhat well-documented event, but with a fantasy flair. Secretly magical beings involved. How much should I worry about historical accuracy? Just the big events. Uh, this is a question from, I can't read your name. Um, dear, <laughs> dear Dor Dar... Uh, I'm sorry if, if that's your actual name, and you're from a Slavic country or something. I apologize. I can't. I can't pronounce it right now. Uh, so, um, by the way, big history buff and love the channel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, I would worry about the big events being being accurate. So, if you're writing about 9/11, you know when the planes hit. You know when the towers fell. That's what you want to focus on. Everything else, you can have it be, oh, nobody knew that this happened. Nobody knew that there were wizards blowing up the buildings instead. Uh, you know, if you were writing some sort of weird novel about 9-11 um, that involved wizards blowing it up instead of people, but people didn't realize it was wizards, then yeah, you just have to have the big stuff there. The things that matter to the story and the things that are going to be obviously accurate or inaccurate. You don't need to know like how the, how the beams of the building were bolted together. You don't need to know that. It's not important. Um, you can even make books that start very historical and then become their own thing down the road. Um, if you're writing alternate history, that's a great way to start. Like, you know, I'm trying to remember who wrote the series. I had a friend who was super in, into it, like in middle school and high school. You go back in time and you give an M16 to the Confederate Army and then they win the Civil War, right? Um, I Sometimes those sorts of, of setups to me become annoying. Uh, I'll, I'll complain about this one, right? If you went back in time and gave an M16 to the Confederate Army, it wouldn't have done anything because they wouldn't have had the massive amount of capital infrastructure needed to make and machine one other M16. Um, you don't realize that you need all sorts of crazy equipment to make an M16. Now, you can make an M16 out of steel. You could machine one if you wanted to. The plans exist online. But you need all sorts of specialized equipment that was developed well after the Civil War to even hand make one. Uh, much less manufacture receivers, barrels, the quality of steel was different. So if you went back and you gave an M16 to the Confederate Army, that wouldn't do anything. Um, you're just imagining that, like, what if we gave them a really super strong technology? I'd be, I would rather have them say, like, let's go back in time and make them wizards, and then the wizards win. You know, that would that'd be more believable to me than an M16. Um, because I know I know these things, and so as I complain about them, the setup is is deficient in it simply because of its historic historical accuracy right there. Um, because you wouldn't you'd have to go back in time with a factory to make them, not uh, not just one gun. And it's not like there was some magic knowledge locked away called automatic fire. It's like uh, an automatic rifle. The the concept of a machine gun developed over many decades of constant development. They had Gatling guns. They actually had uh, Gatling guns in the Civil War. So they had rapid fire technology. They just didn't have it in their hands. Um, so it, it one of the so talking about alternate history things where you go back and deliver technology to the ignorant people of the past you have to remember that technology never exists in a vacuum if, you go, if i go back and give a computer monitor and a computer to people in the 19th century they couldn't even power it right much less know what to do with it or how to make more of them you know your phone is only useful because it's connected to a network uh, otherwise it's it would barely run for a few hours before it becomes a brick um, so displaced technology uh, unless you're bringing a huge number of people with the ability to create infrastructure from scratch, it's probably not going to happen. But that brings me to another thing. If you have like a post-apocalyptic post setting, if you don't know, if you don't have engineers that know how to utilize all the manufacturing capital, you're not going to be able to make new stuff. 
you know, all that knowledge goes away. That's how dark ages happen is that the, um, okay. <laughs> Historical theory, how dark ages happen. Dark ages happen when you have a collapse that also has a, a high degree of um, consequential diffused knowledge. So knowledge by its nature is very diffuse. It's not concentrated in, in individuals. The smartest guy in the world, talk about this in the intelligence fallacy video. The smartest guy in the world only knows a, a little tiny amount of knowledge. You know, Bill Gates is a really smart guy, you know, but he probably doesn't know how modern Windows even works, right? He knows he knows how DOS worked. Um, he, he probably wouldn't be a good programmer now. So if you were to pick somebody to go and be a smart guy, he wouldn't be bringing any kind of consequential knowledge. So when you have highly diffused knowledge, uh, which comes from division of labor, and then you have an economic collapse and you have, or you have something that wipes a large number of people out, then that's when you get a dark age. Because if there's one guy who know who, if, if you have one guy in town who runs the dairy and he knows everything about dairy cows and he dies, the knowledge goes away with him. So who you, the cows might be there, but you don't know how to care for them or you don't know how to milk them. And so you lose a lot of the productivity uh, that he developed through his knowledge. Likewise, if you have a blacksmith and the blacksmith dies, it's not like Joe, the farmer can be like, well, I'm going to be the next blacksmith. It's like, that's highly specialized knowledge. So when you have specialized craftsmen die, you lose the knowledge. You have to have other craftsmen come in and teach you um, how to do it or move into your community. Um, so that's what I think creates a lot of these dark ages is that you have, um, like for instance, writing. Writing has never until the modern era been something that everybody knows how to do. Um, people look at these dirty medieval peasants like the peasants were all illiterate and idiots. It's like, well, no, they were pretty, they were just as smart as you were, but they didn't know how to read. Well, how could they be as smart as me and not know how to read? And the answer was, what, what the hell were they going to read in the Middle Ages? Nobody had any books. <laughs> You know, the, the local lord had a library of six books for, for his house to read. So maybe if you were a knight, you, you might learn a little bit of reading and writing, enough to manage your books and write letters to people and know how to write orders. But a peasant, you know, he knew numbers, and that was probably it. He knew the, the minimum amount. Because when when is he going to have the time to exercise the skill? If you teach him to read and write, what's he going to read? Um, so if you have all the scholars die, they literally, the, the language is lost. The written part of the language is forgotten because nobody's alive who remembers it. Um, and one of the things that you see with, with empires, like for instance, the Babylonian and Akkadian empires, Babylon conquered uh, Akkadia, or um, no, no. When the Persians conquered Akkadia, they continued to have all of the, um, all of the records written in Akkadian. Why not? Why not their language? Well, it's because the scholars were there and they knew how to read and write. So you just had them kept, have them keep writing in their old language. Um, why bother? Why bother changing it? Yeah, having to have them convert and learn new knowledge would be expensive and time consuming. Um, so enough of that rant. Um, the Duelist is a great movie. I I love the Duelist. It's awesome. Um, let's see here. Considering when collecting intel, the last thing you want to do is get into a fight and draw attention to yourself and not be able to deliver that intel to whoever hired you. Yeah, ninjas were arsonist spies and rarely assassins, not warriors. Yeah, and, I, and one of the things I have is like, um, you know, I have ninjas attack in Muramasa. There's several ninja attack, ninja attacks. They're not ninjas, right? The way that people think of ninjas, like, you know, let me slip into the shadows and stuff you know, stab someone or whip out my ninja toes. Ninja toes were not a thing, by the way, guys. Those straight swords that like Leonardo, the Ninja Turtle uses, though, those didn't exist <laughs> because you couldn't forge steel that was straight. <laughs> you couldn't forge steel that was straight that wouldn't shatter uh, because of the poor steel that the Japanese had. And I've talked about this in other, other videos, but um, a group of ninjas was just, it was just hired dudes who attacked, you know? It's like, I hired some guys to come and attack you. Uh, from from this this group of guys that are mercenaries that do that um so they are ninjas but they're not what people think of as ninjas it's like we're ambushing you and now we're attacking and now you have to fight your way out and that's a fun action scene that's very exciting right and i wanted some of that classic feel of like being attacked by ninjas but uh, i did not have the ninjas like uh 
using blow darts and, and and crazy stuff it's like nah you they use standard you use a bow and why would you use a blow dart if you can just use a bow and arrow right like a a 100 pound bow with a nice war arrow is really going to put a big hole in someone that's probably what i'd use if i wanted to kill someone at a distance or just get up close to them and hack at them with the sword until they're dead that works really really well um, so that's what i did with my ninjas uh they're they're just dudes who who are hired to attack you know they're, they're mercenaries um What's that one movie where a, a Nimitz class carrier went back to 1941, right before Pearl Harbor? Now, if you brought a whole carrier back to 1941 before Pearl Harbor, that could have made a difference, right? If you brought a whole aircraft carrier full of of F-14s or F-16s or whatever they they're packing on them these days, um, and stopped Pearl Harbor and blew up all the Japanese warships, yeah, that'd make a big difference, uh, but not like one M-16. Right, uh, and then the other thing is, like, let's say you bring back a, a ship of war um, to some past. Now, if you brought it back to Pearl Harbor, you could probably continue to fuel it. But how are you going to fuel the damn thing? There's, you, you realize that just to have a car requires a global economy that is so complex nobody understands it. The economy is so complex, nobody nobody knows how to make a pencil, much less how to get gas into a car. There's a guy in Saudi Arabia who monitors a pump and doesn't even know how the pump works. He knows it pumps oil out. Another guy at a refinery watches machines that someone else designed that turns things into gas. You ship it into your state. Somebody pumps it into the ground. They don't know where the tankers get in the gas. They just know they pay the tanker and they put it in the ground and they sell it to you. Uh, and then you have a car that's designed to run on this. Um, it's actually amazing when you think about it. It's why displaced technology just never really seems to work for me. It's just me. Um, uh, there's another one. Um, <laughs> electrons or electromagnetic force didn't exist before Edison. Well, they existed, but they weren't really known before Edison or Tesla, right? So you wouldn't be able to explain them to something like, there's this thing called electrons. My, my son, who's three, asked me, Dad, how does electricity work? And I'm like, whoa, this is a complicated question. How do I explain to a three-year-old how electricity works? Like, okay, there's a thing called electrons, and they're through all the matter in your body, and they're invisible and tiny. Um, and a whole bunch of them put together makes electricity and you have to have a thing that the electrons flow through. And before I know it, he's like, dad, let's talk about birds. <laughs> electricity is hard to understand. And it is. It's really hard to explain to it. But that's kind of like what you'd be doing. If you went back in time, be like, guys, I have this knowledge called electricity. Let's make an advanced society, uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur court style. And it's like, what, what are electrons, dude? We, what do you, do? What? <laughs> Copper. We don't need have. We don't have copper here. Um, <laughs> people gonna flip because you said Japanese steel sucks. It's not that the steel. The steel is great considering the raw materials that they had. They made swords of very high quality out of rusted iron sand. The worst possible material you could start with to make us to make a sword it's so difficult and it was so time consuming to make a katana that um it's almost mind-boggling and i have the whole process in muramasa he makes a sword and it's not an easy thing you you have a, a specialized smelter who smelts iron sand and you break this you you break the the entire smelted thing apart you smelt it in a big clay pot um that's you know maybe 18 feet long. It'd be a huge clay pot you make just for this. You break it off to get to the steel. You break the steel apart and only some of the steel is even good from that smelting. And then you take some of that steel and you have to heat it up and smash it together and fold it, fold it, fold it, fold it to make it consistent enough that it can work for a sword. And then it's too stiff, it's too brittle. So you put a soft piece in the middle, wrap that good hard steel around it, and then you have a nice straight sword and then in order to forge it so it doesn't shatter, you do differential hardening. So you put a bunch of clay on one part of the blade so it cools slower, and then you leave the edge of the blade open so it cools faster. And the martinite will form a hard crystalline structure that will allow you to cut, whereas the soft core of the blade and the soft back of the blade will give it some resiliency so the blade does not shatter. You dump the straight sword that's been heated up in your forge into the water, and it comes out as a beautifully curved katana. And that's how it's made. And it's really incredible that they came up with that process. 
from looking at red sand to katana. Like, it's actually amazing when you think about it. The amount of knowledge that was required and the amount of trial and error over hundreds of years to know how to turn garbage into something amazing. Like, it's really amazing to think about. Um, let's think of that, see if there's some more stuff. <laughs> He's quoting I pencil. Let's see here. Um, what's more important uh, that from Noldo, I, I think also what's important that perspective of people on things like origin was drastically different from modern times. Absolutely. <laughs> we're learnt people, um, where people in Byzantium placed the religion in their lives and how important it was for them. It's pretty fascinating. Yes. So this is, um, this is a thing. So everybody who's watching this probably has access to a Bible, if not multiple copies in their house. Your average medieval peasant probably knew more about what's in it than you do. Um, and he couldn't read. Why is that? Well, religion was a bigger part of his life than, than the modern modern person. So he went to he went to matins or mass like every day. He went all the time. You know, they had a service every day where you'd have um, you'd get to hear uh, some version of the of the mass performed. If not mass, it was it was a different service. Um, so you'd go and then you'd hear the preacher talk about what was, or you'd hear the the priest um, talk about something that was important in the lay the lay tongue. Um, and you may even know the Latin words for lots of different things that were in the Bible, but you knew a lot more about certainly the magisterium uh, and what the Bible's relationship was to it versus um, today. But at the same time, that doesn't mean medieval pe peasants were super, super pious because there were lots of, uh, lots of things going on with the Catholic Church in the medieval period. It's like, you should go to confession at least once a year which meant that some people were just never going to confession. They weren't doing the religious part of it at all. So there were still people that just weren't really religious back then as well. So you you could get people that were, religion was just the big part of their life. And there was also going to be some people that just didn't really care. Like they just didn't really do it. Um, didn't really commit to it the way that, that other people did. And that's the thing. If you were a cleric, you might be literate, but if you were a peasant, you probably didn't need to. Um, there's also um, some mistakes about peasantry as far as the conditions they lived in and how overworked they were. There's a belief that like peasants were super, super overworked and they weren't. They worked like a hundred days a year or something. And I think English peasants worked more than other peasants. Um, I don't really remember why there was, there was something about it, but uh, you know, peasants didn't work that much, um, which is why you have the, the stereotype of the lazy peon, right? Lazy peon is sitting around not doing anything because peasants didn't really have to work all that much to provide food. Um, so famine only happened because of big events like war, you know, a siege or like a disruption or a major natural catastrophe that wiped out crops. That's what would create famine. Famine didn't like people weren't living in the Middle Ages starving all the time. Most of what killed them was violence and disease, not um, not uh, not food. Um, so that's another thing that people do, um, like with uh, lots of modern ideas about how the past was are are generated by some later periods reflection on it so the enlightenment writers tend to look on the medieval man as like this ridiculously backward stupid idiot and that's not that's not true of the medieval man or that he lived in like total ignorance and abject poverty and yeah he did live in poverty compared to today but he certainly you know, wasn't dying at 30. If you made it to, most people, um, if you made it to adulthood, you would live, you know, a, a reasonably long life of 50 or 60 years uh, before some some disease or another finally got you. Uh, but uh, childhood disease killed a lot of people. And then, you know, uh, or if you had the plague come through, you might you might get unlucky and get the plague and die. Um, but most people lived a, lived a reasonable life. And they also weren't shorter. That's another myth about the Middle Ages. So I think the average height of an Englishman in the, the 1300s was five foot 11. And the average height of an Englishman today is six feet. So there's like a, they've, you know, better, new all the better nutrition of the modern era has let them grow an extra one inch. But you can see today with North Korea, North Koreans are on average several inches shorter than their South Korean counterparts. And, uh, and that's because of nutrition, but that, that famine is imposed by something else that's not natural, that's imposed by the government um, and a central economy that doesn't allow 
you know, normal people to farm and work. Even today, like our farms are so productive. Almost nobody needs to farm and we pay farmers not to farm because there's so much food. <laughs> so the idea that everybody was starving in the Middle Ages isn't true either. Um, um, you don't consider your afterlife more important than your life probably. Yeah, that, it depends on the person. Um, I think there's a belief that the Middle Ages were so hard on people that they would, you know, they made them super religious but that's not really true a lot of people were just not religious back then as well um if you read the alliances and actions of the old european empires most people could sense that a european war was on the horizon yeah that's why you built up you didn't build build up wars to not or build up the uh, war infrastructure to not use it um what really caught a lot of people off guard wasn't that the war occurred but rather how long it bloody lasted that is a very up from Delta Wolf. That's a very poignant statement. I think you're talking about World War One. Um, yeah. So that's that's a thing. Is like everyone thought that they would be home by Christmas, and the war lasted for years and years, and millions of people died. Um, World War One is a very fascinating uh, historical example of of how uh, you know that that war wouldn't have happened in a prior period because people would have had more sense to to stop the war. Prior to that, they would have run out of money and gone home, or, or they would have surrendered early because they're like, ah, this we're not going to come out of this too good. How about we disarm and go home, and we sign a treaty that says we're not going to make war for another five years, <laughs> which is what a lot of a lot of peace treaties were back then. Uh, <laughs> from what I've read, Rome added a couple inches to the Britons way back when. I don't I don't think there's any accurate data as to how tall um, people in Great Britain were during the Roman period. Um, you do have some interesting historical examples. Again, the people writing them, you have to think about what they're trying to, to communicate, where they would talk about Germans, Germans being these like tall and extremely virtuous people. The Germans kind of lived in mud huts and, you know, uh, prior, prior to, uh, the Gauls, you know, the Gauls really, uh, coming through and, and transmitting a lot of that Gaulish culture when they sacked Rome. The Gauls sacked Rome several centuries before Christ. Um, but the Germans, uh, you know, Caesar would write about the Germans or the Germanic people and would say these complimentary things about them. And part of it was that he wanted to communicate virtue to Italians by showing that the Germans, the savage barbarian Germans do this. They were, they have, uh, you know, they have very strong women that will, you know, that will fight you if you insult the men, things like that. Um, and that they were elegant and tall and, and these sorts of things. It was really to communicate virtue. It's like talking about what's virtuous about them. But what might be missing from from the assessment of, of the Germans is like, well, yeah, they. but they also take people they don't like and hang them from a tree until they're rotten and dead or something, you know, like whatever whatever weird rituals the Germans might have had um, prior to Roman. And part of that is we, you know, if you don't have a writing system, we don't know exactly what's going on. You don't have a standard system of measurements prior to the Romans. Um, so we don't really know how tall ancient people were, except by digging them up. So if you dig them up, you can see, oh, well, they really were shorter, you know, which means nutrition might have really been bad um, at a certain point in time. But like the medieval period, uh, English people were not terribly malnourished. Probably some were, right? There's extreme poverty in, in past periods meant hunger. Extreme poverty in the modern period doesn't really mean hunger. It means other things. Um so there certainly were probably some malnourished people in the past, but your average peasant who grew his own food and gave some, he's like, he grew his food and he gave some to his Lord. And that was that, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, people have, uh, World War One is so complicated. There, you could, we could do like a whole stream on, on World War One and how crazy it was. Um, the Germans didn't practice capital punishment, which the Romans considered barbaric. The Romans, yeah, the Romans used to do a thing called a decimate a legion. Decimate means 10. So you would kill one out of every 10 men. So if a legion failed to perform its duty due to cowardice, or um, if they believed cowardice was the reason for a defeat, they would decimate a legion. Now we use decimate to mean like obliterate, but to decimate a legion was at random, you picked one out of every 10 men and you put them to death as punishment. So it was a random punishment, uh, but it was very effective. And we know it was effective because they almost never used it. Uh, because they almost never used it, it means people really didn't, you know, it'd be much better to to 
to really try to win this battle than to be a coward and then possibly just be killed anyway. So in other words, there was no, it, it increased the downside for, um, for loss. So if you lost, you had a much bigger downside um, with the, the threat of decimating the Legion, uh, knowing that anyone could have it, have it happen. No one could be spared. And then there were also, you know, unsuccessful commanders could be banished from Rome. And r banishment from Rome meant that nobody could give you f water or fire for like, I don't remember how many hundreds of miles around Rome. Basically, you'd have to walk into the wilds of northern Italy, like to the Rhone River, and then you could... Uh, then you could get fire and water from somebody. So banishment and exile was like a big punishment in Rome. And there were there were uh, famous Romans that were exiled and managed to return. Caesar, I think, was one of them. Um, Sola was gonna gonna kill Caesar, uh, Gaius Julius Caesar, um, but he was a field and uh, had no. He was he was I'm sorry. He was exiled when he was priest of when he was a priest of. Um, of Jupiter, I think, and then he joined the legions and uh, was able to have his exile out until things changed politically with Sola, and he was able to come back and uh, do all the great things that he did. Uh, Gallipoli, there's a there's a movie called Gallipoli. I think it has Mel Gibson in it um, that I, I remember really enjoying from back in the day. Very very interesting set of stuff. Let me see if there's some more questions up here we can ask. Didn't Maxim think uh, his MG would end warfare? Machine gun would end warfare. Yeah. So this has been a, a this has been an interesting thing in in the past maybe 150 years. The idea that we're going to create a really horrible weapon that will end war. So you create a machine gun. Did that end war? Did the threat of the overwhelming power of the machine gun end war? No, no, it didn't end the war. What about nuclear weapons? Well, even with nuclear weapons, where it's like you face the consequence of obliteration, the U.S. and Russia, or the U.S. and the USSR, still found ways to fight each other in the Cold War by engaging in conflicts that nuclear weapons were off the table. You still find nations that will involve themselves in armed conflict and somehow nukes don't get involved. So nukes, even nukes themselves, don't really prevent war. They just change the way that you fight it. Same thing with a machine gun. Um If there's anything else uh the, the the chat is so interesting it's just people it's just y'all talking to each other not asking questions um so i think i'm starting to run out of time here because it's after eight and i know i started a little bit late but i run quite a bit late here um good example of historical fiction the guns of navarone uh yeah i like that i liked that movie um so let me uh kind of finish up some things here we talk about historical accuracy. Uh, if you're writing fantasy, so let's talk about fantasy. I think it's good to look at a period that is influencing your fantasy and to pick accuracies from that to create the world and the world set that you're working in. So if, uh, you know, I read a, I guess it was a trilogy. I think it was called the Powder Mage Trilogy. The first one was called promise of blood i don't remember the author right now it's a fantasy it's a fantasy book series um it has full-blown mages and then it has guys who do magic like with muskets it has a fairly well thought out premise but if you know anything about anything then it it's it's just a weird way of having two kinds of magic um because guns don't really work that way you know um these ideas that people use like gunpowder is magic it's good to start from there and then kind of add in what you want so if you wanted to have guns you could have guns and gunpowder and the infrastructure that made guns and then you could have magic with it but how would those two affect each other and that's where you start um, for things like swords i tend to think just go with what people used historically because the form of a sword uh, indicates the development of the sword and how it was used so if you look at european arming swords so there's all these different kinds of, all these different variations of the form. You know, there's ones with little broader blades. There's one with more kind of vicious pointed blades throughout history to, to defeat different types of armor. But they're all a handle with a pommel, a cross guard, a double-edged blade that is of a certain length. 
you know, 28 inches or something, uh, or thereabouts. So there's a similar form. If you just say arming sword or sword, people get the idea. They're not, they're not going to sit there and be like, well, is it, a, is it a type 13 oak shot sword or what kind of sword is it? It's like, no, it's just, just say sword and they get the idea that it's an arming sword. It's a one-handed arming sword that, they, that you use with a shield and you can hack people to bits with it. Um, you could just describe it as having a sharp point if you wanted to have a sharp point for like working in between plate armor. If there's plate armor, then look at the swords that went with that armor. So if you want everybody to be wearing ch uh, mail, chain mail armor, and, uh, and gambesons, which were popular throughout most of the Middle Ages, what kind of swords did people use of them? Well, they used double-edged swords with a nice sharp point. The Viking swords had a little broader point, but they weren't fighting against uh, against this robust an armor in the 8 and 900s and to 1100, uh, 1, 1100 AD. Um, so you could pick different different sword varieties you don't have to describe in detail a long channel ran down the middle you know um the, or any of that sort of stuff just say sword and people people get the idea and if you look at classic fantasy there's not a lot of time spent like describing magical swords with jeweled hilts you know we have you have something like excalibur you know you can describe it as being somehow special but if i were going to make a sword special it wouldn't be like in the design of the blade so i've seen some authors be like well, i'm going to design this I'm, i want they're, they're kind of overthinking it. They're thinking, oh, I'm going to have this weapon that I'm imagining is really cool, like a, a Klingon weapon, you know. And uh, those don't really work. Just go with what people used historically because it's believable, it's accurate, it's useful, and people understand it. They instinctively understand sword. Um, so if you just say sword, that's probably going to work. Likewise, shield. You could say heater shield, right? And people get the idea that it's like Link's shield. It looks like, you know, Link's shield. Um, you could say a round shield people get the idea you don't have to to you can know how it's made oh it's had hide over oak and it had straps like this um or it had a handle in the middle and you could do things with it you could go through those sorts of details and it's good to know those you don't need to invent a shield that's covered with spikes armor that's covered with spikes like why didn't historical people have spikes all over their armor to just run into people and impale them it's like because they poke themselves and be heavy you know, you don't have to think too deep about why armor is the way it is, but if you go with what what was developed in history, chances are it's pretty functional. Now, if you introduce something like magic, it might be good to introduce something that counters the magic, like some sort of armor that is can repel the magic. But I would still start with the historical armor as a place to begin and uh, begin your building because that's what worked. You know, that was what... Uh, war is a lot of trial and error. Nobody's going to be wearing armor into battle that just doesn't serve a function um they're going to be wearing armor that works for them you know coat of plates mail plate armor if you're richer those sorts of things in the high middle ages all that stuff can be in play um and most fantasy fans aren't going to like ding you if you're like you don't describe them as having the proper kind of male coif that's just pedants like me but even then i don't care um it's just something that i notice I notice it, but I, I never, I never really knock authors down for it unless it's, it's like bringing an M16 to the Confederate forces. Like unless the, the premise is incredibly stupid, um, then I, I don't really, it doesn't really bother me. So like if you have a weird fancy sword with teeth all over it, whatever, uh, I think it's a little dumb, but uh, it's not going to make me think your book sucks. But if you have, well, here's a, here's a sword that shoots bullets out in every direction. I'm like that's really, that's too much, you know. <clears throat> Oh, the way they use knives in Dune, this is actually really good. So it's Lobster Eleven's telling me. The person's shield stops anything that travels fast, thus making bullets useless. So yeah, anything that travels fast, the shield will block it. So only if you're going at a certain speed are you able to penetrate through the shield and stab someone, making dueling a very weird um, and ritualized process in Dune. That's very creative. You start with this idea. Force field stops anything that has fast kinetic energy. Well, in order to defeat that, you have to have slow energy. So that's how that's how you develop it. You start from um, one limitation and you create everything that goes with it, logically. And that makes it feel more real. And we don't have to know how the electronics work that creates a force field. Oh, is it, what's making the force field? Is it graviton? No, so it doesn't matter. It's just that it exists. Like using a cutlass on a space navy ship. <laughs> Why would you use a cutlass? <laughs> I have no idea. 
It's easier to disarm on country with nukes. Than, yeah, okay. Um, a lot of this is comments. You guys are having your own conversations, which is great. I just can't look at all of them. <laughs> plate mail. So there's plate mail. <laughs> so there's no such thing as plate mail, right? There's, um, you know, there's coat of plates, which is you have plates and they're put into a, like a leather coat. And they usually wear mail underneath it. Um, so you don't have plate mail. Although I, th I think RPGs have used this. Let me let me address this real quick before I go. His arms and armor are, are, are an important thing. So RPGs have their own systems for how arms and armor worked. You know, you usually have cloth armor is the weakest armor. Then you have leather armor. And then you have mail armor. And then you have plate armor. And did all these things exist simultaneously? Absolutely. But they didn't have a, hi a hierarchy where it's like, you're a warrior and therefore you can carry heavier plates. The, uh, the plate armor of Northern Italy, which is, which is the, the highest caliber of plate armor, um, is from Gothic Germany and Northern Italy in the uh, Renaissance. That's my opinion. There's not that the English didn't and the Spanish and those guys didn't know how to make armor. But if you're thinking of those classic suits of armor, they're usually Northern Italian um, or, or they're Gothic, which is German. Um, so uh, those were actually not that heavy and were pretty easy to move around in, you know, but they were really expensive. So your average guy had what was called munitions armor, which looked like plate armor but it wasn't really fitted and you could kind of put it on you might have like a queer ass and like some leg plates and stuff so munitions armor was the cheaper cast offs that didn't fit you as well as like an actual suit of armor uh, but you also had uh, a lot of men in arms that wore coat of plates with mail so you had all this stuff existing continuously what you probably didn't have was leather you know leather is just its own armor leathers gets cut really easy and you can stab through it um it it, it's okay for reinforcing or holding the plates together in a coat of plates. But if you if you have like a, a fantasy character and he's like, you came up with this leather armor on, I'd be like, you don't know what armor is. <laughs> leather armor, you, you'd actually wear a gambeson, cloth armor. So it really should be leather is the worst, followed by gambeson. Gambeson was really effective. People wore it underneath their mail, underneath their, their plate armor, or just by itself. They wore gambeson, which is very thick, kind of quilted cloth, um, usually linen. Uh, and then you'd have mail, and then you'd maybe have plate. Um, but if you're looking at a time period where nobody has plate armor, then it's going to change things a little bit. So uh, don't look at how RPGs do it, where it's like, oh, the, the armor reduces damage or something like that. It's like, no, the armor is basically impenetrable until you penetrate it. And when you do penetrate it, it's probably not going to kill the guy unless you're really good and can like get get a point under his gorget and like into his neck and like punch through the mail there, which guys did. Um, if you wanted to kill a fully plate armored knight, the best weapon to do it with was probably your dagger because your dagger, you could actually get you could actually get into like the elbow and like cut their artery or like actually jam it through the plates in some cases. Your dagger was probably more effective than a lot of things. You know, you could hit them with your war hammer and maybe break a bone if you're really good, but the plates were really robust. Um, you could work your long sword in there if you're really good, um, which a lot of a lot of uh, knights did. Uh, so it's good to know that stuff, but, but don't look at uh, what RPGs do as the way to do it. Or that two-handed swords swing slower. There's another thing. Two-handed swords don't swing slower. They You could swing a two-handed sword faster than a one-handed sword because you do this kind of leverage thing with it. Um, where the tip, because it's longer, it's like having a longer stick, the tip is accelerating a lot faster. Uh, and you have greater reach um, than, than uh, shorter swords. So throw the RPG rule sets out. RPGs are there to create a fun game. They're not there to reflect anything accurate about the way they, people physically interact with each other. Daggers are not faster than swords, right? Uh, um, <laughs> cloth armor is not worse than leather armor. Um, you did have boiled leather armor in the, in the Renaissance called a, a buff coat, but um, you know leather armor really wasn't that much of a thing. Um, so anyway, that's, that's some stuff to think about for that. Uh, the leather biker gear. Yeah. Um, in zero G, a bullet would ricochet everywhere and could damage equipment. So you need space cutlass. Actually, it wouldn't, you know, it'd probably be, it'd probably hit something and stop, you know, um, bullets only ricochet if they're hitting something that's as hard as them, uh, and they're at an oblique angle. So I'll just... Let me bring my gun expertise in this because I've been shooting since I was three. Um, if you fire a bullet into a plate of steel, even, unless that steel 
it is exceptionally hard and it's at the perfect angle, that bullet is not going to bounce back at you. There's a really famous video of a guy shooting like a, a 50 caliber and he hits this metal plate and it comes back and shoots off his earmuffs. And that's like, it's the most frightening thing to ever think of. But I've never seen that happen. In every case I've seen the lead hit steel, just deform and make a, a big lead splat on a piece of steel, even shooting like 50 caliber, really big guns. Ricochets happen if you have a rock and it hits it at an oblique angle, then you have a ricochet. Anything that's firing directly into, into something, wood, steel, it's, the bullet's probably gonna stop. You know, and I've shot lots of different materials with lots of different um, calibers of weapons. Uh, now, what would be interesting shooting in space is if you punched a hole in the hole, you'd start to you'd start to lose atmospheric pressure, but it wouldn't immediately depressurize you. It it happened over time, so it would be dangerous to use a gun in space only because you risk depressurization if you shatter a window or punch through the hole or something, which could indicate that you use a space cutlass, um, or it could indicate that you use some other kind of weapon um, that you can think of. In my stories, it was like gravity-based weapons that would crush things uh, that didn't really risk breaking, you know, breaking any of your fragile membranes that kept you from uh, suffering loss of atmosphere. Anyway, all of those are really fun things. Um, yeah, the air marshals use fragile bullets so you don't put, yeah, you could use like a really soft nosed all lead bullet that's no, a no an unjacketed bullet would probably work. Could I make a mech suit in medieval fantasy setting? Why not? If you have a super advanced magical, like maybe there's wizards that make mech suits and they're powered by magic. Who cares? Yeah, as long as, as long as you think it's cool and readers will think it's cool and it makes sense to the people that are there and it, it has the correct impact on the world. Yeah, you could do mechs, why not? So when you grab the blade of the sword and use it as a spear, the worst I've had with shooting steel was a tiny piece of copper jacket from a nine millimeter that wasn't traveling fast enough to cause harm. <laughs> I'm trying to think the worst thing that's happened since I when I was shooting. I've never had anything like really bounce back and hit me. Um, other than I've had, so I've had when shooting shotguns, I've had pieces of hot shot hit me from different things. Like you know you're, you know you're you're following the line of like a dove and it flies behind some branches and you shoot you know you you shoot the branches and like it stops the the shot and some of the shot falls down in you and it's it's smoking hot and it's like oh god or you get um you get a hot casing you guys if you've been shooting you may have had this happen where um you have a casing that eject kind of funny and it goes like right in here oh man ooh, it's the worst and um if you're i know a lot of guys that have been in the army you got you have these big um you know these big bulletproof vests on and they have the high collar it's really protective but if you get if you get a hot 223 casing in there a hot 556 casing in there you can't get it out you're gonna have this big serious burn on your neck because it's so deep you can't get your hand in there to get the to get the casing out it's just burning you uh it's very painful so that's a that's an accident that can happen um this is just this isn't historical accuracy but gun realism guns guns malfunction all the time if you're having muskets muskets uh fail to fire they misfire all the time um uh you may have a flash in the pan, which is where um, on a flint lock you have a pan come out and the flint strikes and the sparks go into the pan and it burns the prime powder charge, but it doesn't ignite the, the main charge inside uh, the rifle or inside the musket. And so it doesn't go off. And so what do you do? What do you do when that happens? That's something that I wish more people would put in stories is gun failures because guns do fail or you get a smokestack um, where your casing gets caught as the uh, as the slide backs back up and you got to stop clear that before you can continue fighting. I've never seen that happen in a movie and I I think Stephen Hunter's the only person I've ever seen write about it. <laughs> Most writers just skip it. They like guns always function flawlessly for some reason in in uh in stories and in real life, they malfunction all the time. You know, there's always something unpredictable. Um, so I, I did a whole video on that. So I think I'm gonna have to, to let it go here. The, the the chat has been so interesting in and of itself, it's really hard to know what to address. Hopefully this has been interesting for you. I'm really sorry for starting late, but um, sometimes real life happens and my wife is at a really, really important meeting um, and that I didn't have anyone else available for childcare 
just things didn't work out for me to get on uh, get on on time. So I appreciate your patience for that. Um, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe if you're watching the recorded version of this video. Uh, every Wednesday at six o'clock, this is where I'm at. Except today I was a little little bit late, and I apologize for that. You can support my work, not on Patreon, but you can find my books on Amazon or go to dvspress.com. You can find them. Um, they're they're wide. They're also on Barnes and Noble, Kobo. They're on everything as far as eBooks, and the paperbacks should be available in most stores as well. They're for sure available on Amazon. Um, if you want paperbacks, all my books are available in paperback. Uh, if you're interested in reading Needle Ash, you should know that there will be a compendium coming up, a collected volume, which is how I originally wanted to release it. I decided to do an experiment and, um, and break each act up into its own book. Um, so I'm putting those back together into one big long book and I'll be releasing that uh, shortly. So make sure you keep an eye out for that. Be on my list, dvspress.com slash list, and I'll have news about when that's coming out. And I have another book coming out after that as soon as I can get around to getting it finished and polished up and put out a few more books I need to edit. So this this could be a big year for books. I could put out, you know, more than three, but we'll see. We'll see how it works. So I appreciate everybody watching and all the, the history conversations. It's stuff that I really love to think about. And a lot of people have more insight than I do about things that I don't know about. Like I know, you know, I don't even know that much about Roman history to my mind. Um, but like, I know nothing say of like, Ottoman history. So if you're writing um, something that's like has Ottoman history, that's that's always something interesting to me um, to look at too. So uh, if I don't know about it, the main thing is you want to apply the principle, the principle of knowing how to write something that's historically accurate, whatever you choose to research. So thank you so much for watching. Um, if you want my historical fiction book, it's called Muramasa Blood Drinker. It takes place in um, early 16th century Japan, so late Muramachi period. You can also call it the Sengoku period, the Warring States period, which is a very interesting period historically for Japan. It's one of the most interesting um, periods in the country's history because of the complexity of the politics and the war and everything that goes on in there. So that's where I chose to set that book and I had a lot of fun writing it. Um, hopefully you'll enjoy reading it if you choose to read it. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. All right, I forgot one thing because I'm like putting up links. I do have that Scipio shirt for sale. You can also find me on Subscribestar. Subscribestar is rolling payments back out after they got banned by everybody. So instead of Patreon, you can find me on Subscribestar. I haven't been plugging Subscribestar as much just because I didn't know the future of it. Um, but because I'm approved for some reason, they know I'm a real person. You can check me out on Subscribestar and, um, and throw me a dollar on that as a tip. And I really do appreciate it. I'll see you guys next time.